Hey guys, welcome to Boxing Squared for boxing news and views from around the internet. This is the first of a two-part look at the current contenders in the heavyweight division for 2018. So the loose criteria that I've set is that they need to have had at least one proper step-up fight, be coming off a good win, or at least have given a good account of themselves in a loss. Or they have a chance at a title shot because of their standing in the division, their past history, or their connections. So guys that are coming off a bad loss, especially if they're in the twilight of their career, I've largely excluded, and also those who are still at the prospect status, or those who haven't had a true step-up fight, they haven't been considered either. And I'll look to do something on those guys in another video, because a step-up is not without risk, and sometimes the O does have to go. And some of those guys should be stepping up. But sometimes, they lose. Adrian Granat, a good example from last year. So the champions, they are obviously excluded for obvious reasons, as is Luis Ortiz, who is set to take on Deontay Wilder. I covered that off in the sort of my brief thoughts in a previous video. Uh, before I get to the first crop of about 10 or so contenders, it's probably worth running through some of those I've left out. And why? Christian Hammer, first off. He's coming off a convincing loss to Alexander Povetkin in December 2017. So all the momentum that he built up with his wins over Erkin Tepa and David Price, gone. And while he's only 30, I don't see him making much of a push in 2018. Alexander Ustinov, he had a bad, bad loss to Manuel Char in November 2017. With him being on the wrong side of 40 now, and looking so bad against Char... Well, his days as a contender, they are gone. They are done. I would expect he'll probably retire soon. Gerald Washington. Decent skills, decent power, but he couldn't put it together in 2017, picking up two losses on the bounce to WBC champion Deontay Wilder and also to Jarrell Miller. The Miller loss, that was particularly bad because he looked like he was beaten mentally before he got in the ring. Jarrell Miller embarrassed him in the pre-fight and he just didn't look right heading into it and that doesn't bode well for his future prospects if someone can get that far under his skin and he looks beaten before he gets in there Berman Stavern well <laughs> the less said about Berman Stavern the better at 39 he's coming off an embarrassing loss to Deontay Wilder he's done I can't ever see him featuring again in big time boxing Eric Molina, the drummer boy, he took another L in 2017 at the hands of Dominic Brazil. So that's likely all but extinguished his chances at another shot at the top level. He was lucky that he actually had two title shots in the first place. David Price, he might be making a comeback after a terrible performance against Christian Hammer earlier in 2017, but it's hard to see him featuring at world level anymore or even anything close to it. I mean, maybe he can get back to European level at best. Who knows, good luck to him, but I don't see it happening. And that kind of goes for Derek Chisora the next name. He had a game plan in place to get back in the conversation for a title shot and perhaps a Dillian White rematch, but it all came a cropper when he was beaten, and rather convincingly so, by then fringe contender Ajit Kabuya. Marius Wok. He looked old and laboured for the most part when he took on Jarrell Miller in late 2017. And his days as a contender, surely behind him now. Artis Bilka, similar situation. His best days do appear behind him. He was knocked out in stunning fashion by the then fringe contender Adam Kanowski in 2017. So any chance of another run to a title, well that took a severe dent with that loss. And to round out the guys who I haven't considered... Robert Hellenius. He promised so much heading into his encounter with Dillian White, but in the end he delivered an impression of a sparring partner. It was truly dreadful stuff from the Nordic Nightmare, a nightmare performance. And it probably brings the curtain down, well and truly down, on his title ambitions. Okay, so let's move into the actual contenders. And bear in mind what I've already said, so prospects, not considered. The guys I've just mentioned, not considered. And also, if you don't hear one of your favorite fighters who is a contender, or you believe to be a contender, just wait for part two. So I'm doing half now and half in the next video. And if you don't hear it in either, well then take issue with me then. Let's crack into it. 
It's probably worth starting with the most controversial figure in the heavyweight division, possibly in all of boxing, Tyson Fury. And Fury, he has been out of the ring for two plus years battling his own personal issues since a career-defining win over Vladimir Klitschko. So I know you might be wondering, why have I included Tyson Fury in this list of contenders? And rattling him off is the first one. A couple of reasons, and I wanted to, to largely get him out of the way, bring it up up front. Um, when he voluntarily handed back his WBA and WBO straps before he would have been stripped of them, because there was that well-publicized recreational drug use that he admitted to, there was a lot of talk at the time about him potentially being made a champion in recess. So it was widely reported at the time as an option that the WBA and WBO could consider. So I've been trying to dig that out and get some concrete information on what those sanctioning bodies actually did or didn't do on that front. So I'll follow up directly with them to clarify because I haven't been able to find anything on their websites. But say he is the champion in recess for the WBA and WBO. And this is what I'm getting to. One of the reasons why I included him. He would get a shot at his old belts if he wanted to. Well, that could be potentially one of the stipulations. He may have a period of time which he could do it after he comes back. So he could pursue that course. And we know publicly right now, he seems determined to go after Anthony Joshua. He holds the IBF strap. That was one that Fury once did hold, but he got stripped because he was going into the Klitschko rematch. So then that went to a Glaskov martin um, fight. They fought Martin won, then Martin fought Joshua. So that's how Joshua got the belt. So see the tweets on screen. So Fury has been calling out Joshua repeatedly. He's been upping the ante in the last couple of weeks, the last sort of 10 days in particular, something every day basically, trying to get under the skin of Anthony Joshua, a la what Joseph Parker and Deontay Wilder were able to do sort of six or eight weeks ago. But it does leave me wondering, why is he doing this now? Why is he going after Joshua when he knows that Anthony Joshua is about to sign a unification bout with Joseph Parker that's been very public, it's been getting very close, and even before he started these tweets, it was basically a done deal. They were just quibbling over the purse split and some of the other details. The money was the big issue. But he's pushing very hard to get it. And it leaves me wondering... Why? What's the motivation behind this? He's been out of the ring for two years. He probably will need some comeback fights just to get in shape, just to, to get back his rhythm. And bear in mind, this is also from his Twitter feed from earlier in December. So this is before the Anthony Joshua tweet started up. He was saying he would need some warm-up fights. He also said to ESPN in mid-December 2017, to ESPN, that to get in fighting shape, Mentally and physically is a long, hard road, and he was only a quarter mile down a 10 mile track. So it's got me wondering, you know, it's got me a little confused about this. Is he calling out Joshua to try stay relevant despite his inactivity? I mean, I guess that's anyone's guess what the motivation is. I don't know if he's really serious about wanting Joshua in his first fight back. My personal view is he needs a handful of warm-up bouts just to shake the ring rust off, ensure he's in proper shape, mentally and physically, for a big domestic clash with someone like Anthony Joshua. I don't see the point in him rushing and potentially tripping himself up at the first hurdle. That would be crazy. And when he does come back, say he has a couple of warm-up contests, he may actually look dreadful in them or scratchy. He will probably need a good couple just to, to get those things, the rhythm, the timing, get everything else clicking again. I mean, it's easy to look good smashing the pads, as we know, but actually getting in the ring and doing it, competitive bout, is a completely different thing, especially at a relatively high level. In some journeymen, you can't underestimate them. So moving on though, Tyson's cousin, Huey Fury. He is one of the few guys that I've included in this contender list that's coming off a loss. Fury showed enough against Joseph Parker to prove that he is going to be a handful for the division if he makes a few adjustments, a few tweaks offensively. In particular, he's got to let his hands go more often when he is in the ring. He can't just run the London Marathon as many people have said. 
Fury is, though, going to be in the ring sometime in April. That's what Peter Fury has said, his trainer and his father, uh, and three times in total in 2018. So we have to see who he actually shapes up against. Lucas Brown was a potential opponent that was bandied around a few months ago, but that seems to have gone west. But I do think Fury, he's going to be in the scene for a long time. He's shown enough. He's going to be dangerous for a lot of guys. Alexander Povetkin. He looks set to challenge for either the WBO or WBA strap in 2018. Having worked his way back into position with wins over Christian Hammer and Andre Rodenko in 2017. For now, it seems the sanctioning bodies, they are willing to let things lie, let these unification matchups play out, see who's got the straps at the end. But you can bet your bottom dollar that Pavetkin, he will be among the first, if not the first name called, once that situation with the unifications plays out. Tony Bellew. I know he's a blown-up cruiserweight who defeated another blown-up cruiserweight in the form of an injured David Hay, but he's still got the win. That's why he's on this contender list. And he does have the chance to, to prove it wasn't just luck and just because of the injury when they meet again in May. So a second win, it would certainly solidify him as a true contender at heavyweight, and it could ultimately lead to a tilt at a title and another good payday. He does have good connections. He is with Eddie Hearn from Matchroom, so who knows what will happen if he does beat David Hay again. And you can't mention value without mentioning David Hay. Hay will want redemption. He will want the win. He will want to beat Tony Bellew, put all that mess from the first fight behind him, and he will want to come through it to try and catapult himself into the conversation for a title shot. And if not a title shot, another big payday. And we know that Hay's best days, they are clearly behind him. But he's still a face, and he still generates lots of dollars. And that's important in boxing, and that could be the thing that helps his cause ultimately, should he get past Tony Bellew. Adam Kanowski, he is the next guy on my contender list. When Kanowski demolished Artis Bilka, he joined the ranks of contenders and became a man to watch. Don't be surprised if after another eye-catching performance, or two, that he's right in the frame for a title shot, particularly in the WBC, where he's ranked 13th currently. Another North American potentially in frame for a shot at the WBC strap is former title challenger Andy Ruiz Jr., who somehow after a year out, after his loss to Joseph Parker, is still ranked 4th. He's managed to hold on to that position without throwing a punch. It sort of beggars belief, really. I mean, there had been talk of him making his ring return in February, or thereabouts, somewhere about then. But I can no longer see a date listed on BoxRec. So there had been some talk and some speculation that he'd be fighting in February, and the opponent would possibly be former title challenger Chris Ariola. So we'll have to see what happens with that. That's, that sort of talk seems to have died down. Another on the comeback trail is former title challenger Bryant Jennings, who is now with Top Rank. So the Top Rank boss, Bob Aaron, he has this well-publicized co-promotional arrangement with Joseph Parker's promoter, Duke Vince. And this is something he's never really cashed in on. There's been talk about it, but it hasn't really come to fruition. And he's been more overt as this deal is about to run out at the end of this year, that he wants to set up a clash between Jennings and Parker before 2018 is out. I mean, who knows if that can happen because Parker now is set to face Anthony Joshua. Should he lose, obviously has no belt. So that prospect of a Jennings and um, Parker fight, it's looking more remote. But Jennings, he's a quality boxer and he's worthy of contender status. And the final two contenders that I'm going to mention in this part one is Frieza Kendo and Manuel Cha, who will be facing off sometime in the coming months. Given the WBA is legally obligated to ensure Akendo gets a title shot due to contractual arrangements dating back to 2014, his contender status does have a little bit of an asterisk next to it. But he will be taking on Manuel Char, who recently fought Alexander Ustinov to pick up the WBA regular title in late 2017. It was a very good performance by Char probably the best of his career, and he'll need to replicate it again to defeat Akendo. And in case you're wondering why I've included Char 
on this contender list. I mean, the WBA regular title, it might be a strap, but it is the minor of the two that the WBA has at heavyweight, the super belt being with Anthony Joshua at the moment. I mean, it's generally not recognized as, as highly from the other sanctioning bodies either. So thus, Char's inclusion. What do you make of the contender list there? And don't worry, there is a part two and more contenders to come. So you've got the likes of Jarrell Miller, Lucas Brown, Dillian White, and others. They are going to be in part two, so please don't put a comment saying you've left out them because they are in the second part. And who do you like this year? Who do you think is going to make some movement? So we know there's going to be some unification movement, but there will be some bouts after that, and others are going to have to fill the breach, fill the void, and take on the champs. Drop a comment, hit like, hit subscribe, follow me on Twitter, boxing underscore squared. I'm out.